to your colleagues is always when you come to where Harry is there, I feel really student-like. So it's a good thing being a student, okay? So you can forget about all your uh, worries and then be a real scientist. So, so today what I'm going to talk about is uh, welding of blast alloy, 116 steel. And I'll tell you why the background and everything. And uh, the work is mostly done by students, of course. Jeremy Karam is graduated. Right now he works for a uh, company, Haynes International. He's a welding metallurgist there. Shingwa Yu is the one who's done a lot of Adam Pro work. He's my student. He's right now uh, finishing up his PhD soon, maybe looking for a job. And Shin Yu is uh, another PhD student working under supervision of John Lippold. John is my colleague. So we work together in this project. And this funding for this just came from Office of Naval Research. I'd like to talk about still steel is very strong. And you can see there's a lot of steel-related work. We are work uh, mostly. You can see one of uh, students from Korea, she's working on the pipeline steel also. So what I'm going to talk about today is mostly related to the blast welding, but um, steel is still, I bleed steel, so. Okay, so that's a good thing. And uh, okay, so most of the work, this collaboration came also from Northwestern, Greg Olson, professor, and David Seidman, uh, the uh, Adam Pro work, and also, uh, Japanese Welding Research Institute with Professor Karasaki and Professor Kumi, so you'll see why they are relevant in this work. As you all know, I don't need to talk here. It's a graduate institute for iron technology. There is a still a lot of need for developing new steels, and uh, you may know this uh, It's no longer a banana curve, of course, but this you can see elongation versus tensile strength. You are trying to improve both strength and elongation. And there is uh, new steels are being developed every other day. You can see that. There is a, a super bainite and then quenchton partitioning and a lot of uh, accidental invention like flash processing of steel. There's so much going on. So it's, it's exciting time. And in addition to that, there are new applications where you have to steel is being pushed to its limits. And, uh, but all of them have to be welded. So you can do quite a lot of heat treatment, control heat treatment. Finally, it comes back to a welder to make it put together and put it in service. So that becomes really hard. I'd like to talk about, for example, how they make the steel for welding for making ships. You can see that's a ship. But if you have to make this, you have these panels. These are all made up of high strength steels. And then you need to weld them. So you have to sometimes you'll do multi-pass welding. You can see different passes are made. And during that complex weld thermal cycle, you can have totally different microstructures each and every region. You need to characterize them, and then you can use techniques like uh, transmission electron microscope or atom probe, understand them, and then give back feedback to the welder how to improve the welding property. So it is very important to understand the phase transformations, microstructure evolution, and properties during welding. So, But however, welding is so dynamic. So I put, this is a high-speed video of a pulsed cast tungsten arc welding. And you can see this, this interface is a liquid solid interface. We usually assume it moves at a steady state. It doesn't. It actually wow, vibrates along a particular mean velocity going up and down. Those up and down excursions can lead to totally different phase selection phenomena in steel. So we need to understand that too. In addition to that, we also had to worry about all the ionization, hydrogen, also nitrogen. They're all getting into the system, solidification, solid state phase transformation, everything has to be done. So this becomes really complex. And if you ask a person, what is the material to be weldable, you will get a lot of answers. But there is a definition for that. If you go and search in Wikipedia, you can see there is a weldability there. So I'm going to talk about that. The weldability means if you develop the steel, you need to be able to weld them. So put it for a specified geometry. That means distortion, without distortion, without extensive amount of residual stress, and also it has to meet the properties. For example, if you're doing it for offshore structures, you should have high toughness. If you're using it for chrome moly steels in a power plant, you should have a good creep rupture property. So there is, this is very, very demanding. And most often, you will have a 60 or such independent variables. So it becomes really hard. So most of the time, the welding is local optimization. You know something, you stay close to it. That's what you, most of the time it happens. But uh, I put this uh, uh, eye chart, we call it. These are the different problems you may face depending upon what steels you're working, what alloys you're working. And 
this we are going to talk about few of them today. Okay? So it's always good to have an example for discussing the vulnerability. So I'm going to take this example of Blast Alloy 160. I don't know how many of you may remember. This is a USS Cole, which was actually uh, some terrorist came and banged it with the boat with the full laden with explosives. It is not because of flooding of water people got killed. Most the reason why people got killed is the steel actually sharpened. It became very, very small pieces. It uh, hurt people. That is how people got dead, died in this uh, accident there or uh, terrorism. But so immediately, U.S. Navy said, okay, we need to do something about it. So they invested quite a lot of money to develop a steel, which is called BA-160 steel. This was actually developed by Professor Greg Olson. He used his uh, methodologies, computational design methodologies to develop the steel. So we're going to look more detail into that steel. So uh, this is actually relies on, this is a composition of the steel. And you can see very low carbon. The argument for using very low carbon is if you have low carbon, you will not have hydrogen embrittlement. So you can have a good welding characteristics. That was the only criteria which was given. And then the rest of them are designed such a way to give you a precipitates in a martensitic or bainitic matrix. So, and you can see that very detailed heat treatment. You have to austenitize at very high temperature, water quench, go to liquid nitrogen to get rid of all the retained austenite and then come back to room temperature and then do this two tempering heat treatments. When you do this, this is what the microstructure you will see. This is an uh, atom probe data, and you can see this is a uh, matrix of a modern site, and within that, you have this nanoscale copper precipitates, and also you may see some uh, molycarbide precipitates also. This gives you phenomenal strength, and also the toughness and everything which gives you in the steel. Okay, now. You need to weld them. So that's the main problem. So how do you weld them? So before uh, US Navy is, wants to scale up this alloy, because this is very expensive alloy. If you need to make them big plates and put it in deployment, they wanted to make sure that it can be welded. So that is why this project was started. They gave us this material, use small scale testing methodologies, go back and find out whether this material is weldable. So that's the charter given to us. So we, as usual, we will do a simple test. So we did a, one of the tests where we're trying to put this welding over here. And this is a fillet weld. Most of the times, you will have a fillet weld joints. And we were looking at what is happening at different peak temperature. This is a weld pool here. And you can see uh, coarse grain heat affected zone, fine grain heat affected zone. These are the terminologies we give and with reference to austenite grain. And uh, when you do, after the simulation, look at the hardness of the material, we see this. This is the original hardness to start with. And as you do the different heat treatments, you can see the softening. That's what we expected, because we knew that we can't hold the copper precipitates in solution. They will coarsen or they'll dissolve. But interestingly, we saw this behavior also. We didn't understand why suddenly it goes up uh, with a little bit of strength. So goal is, if you could understand this, we may be able to offset this softening. So bring it back after welding. We can have a more or less hardness. Then we can tell the US Navy that, hey, we can go and make a big scale uh, melting of the steel so we can address this softening. So we wanted to understand why this decrease occurs and why we are getting this hardening there also. So we need to get into the fundamentals of how microstructure evolution occurs. Okay. So this is a typical uh, thermal cycling we do. Uh, rapidly heating up to high temperature. This is around 1,300 degrees centigrade or so. And then you cool down. This we call it as coarse grain heat affected zone. And usually in welding literature, they call it CGHAZ. So I don't want more acronyms. So that's coarse grain region there. And then you also cool down to different peak temperatures. This is a little bit lower, 900. And then this is around 750. Another one is just around 650. So we can actually see them, that these three materials undergo a phase transformation, that is austenite forms here. On cooling, you can see heat of evolution, so there is some transformation is going on. In the case of sample heated to 650, there's nothing like that, mainly because we did not form any fresh austenite on heating. Again, you can prove that using galatometry too. You can see that 
uh, cooling from high temperature. This is where the transformation occurs for all these three heat cycles. This guy went for just ride, nothing happened there. Okay, we see that. So, what happened to the copper? Did the coppers vanish by doing this heat treatment or how the precipitates are stable or not stable? So, we wanted to understand this first. So, I don't need to, I think you have a leak here, correct? Local electric. So, I don't know, I, we, all, most of you know about this technique, but for people who may not know, quickly I'll go through. We are making small needles cooling down to cryogenic temperatures and then we apply a voltage pulse or a laser pulse to remove one atom at a, at a time. And then we know when we ejected the atom, when we detect it, so time of flight will tell you what atom it is. And then we can go back and reconstruct the whole uh, micro nanostructure or so in a computer and then we can see what happened. So in this case, we are using uh, laser pulsing, even though which is not recommended for looking at carbon. In this case, it's okay. We are only looking at comparative purposes of how the copper precipitates evolves in the sample. So you need to be worried about if you are really interested in the ideal composition of copper, using a laser is not a good idea. Okay, so you can that's where cooling down the temperature. Okay, so I'm going to only show the results. There's a lot of data analysis goes before you come to this data. I'm going to discuss this briefly. This is a sample which was heated to 650 degrees centigrade. That means you did not form any fresh austenite. So you can see these copper precipitates are very, very stable, still there, but some amount of coarsening has occurred. For this image, we have removed all the ion atoms. You are only seeing the copper atoms there. You can see this is a precipitate, another precipitate. You can count how many precipitates are there, and we can also find out how much is the radius of each one of them, and then we can plot as a function of different conditions. So I'm going to walk you through this. So this is uh, more or less same. In the case of 750 degrees centigrade, you formed around 80% or austenite there. So there is some amount of dissolution occurs, not completely. You can see still the copper precipitates are there. But if you go to around 900 and 1300 degrees centigrade, that is where you have fully austenitic structure. So everything goes away. The copper precipitates dissolve. and. Uh, the one, our software, of course, shows some kind of copper clustering here, but however, you need to be worried about it because this is, could be an artifact because of or the way we analyze. So for a moment, you can think about there's no precipitates in these two conditions there. So, so what? We found all these things. We are dissolving. It's kind of expected. So we wanted to understand how these characteristics can be useful to evaluate strengthening because of the precipitates. Okay, so before that, let's talk about is this common what you're seeing here. So this is a phase diagram a calculation uh, from using thermocal. This is copper in ferrite and copper in austenite. As you go up, in, this is a typical thermal cycle. When you go from P1 to P2, that is if you're around here, uh, 650 or so, mostly you will have a coarsening. And if you go above there, you'll have a partial dissolution. That's what we see. And if you go completely above the AC3, the most of the copper precipitates will dissolve completely. But you one could argue that what happens while cooling down, will the copper precipitate come out of the FCC? But even if it comes out, it's going to be not playing a role in strengthening because they're coming out of the austenite. But we didn't see them anyway in our case. So that's the typical way the copper precipitates coarsen and dissolve. No surprises. That's what we expected to start with. Our atom probe results confirm that. Okay. So what? We can use those information to predict the strengthening characteristics. And this is, uh, Shingwa went back all the way to Russell and Brown. This is 1972 paper, classic paper, which talks about if you have a, a precipitates, in this case, the strengthening is by dislocation cutting mechanism. And when you do that, you can actually calculate the uh, strengthening factor by based on your modulus and also based on the dislocation interaction that you can actually calculate for a given radius also. We did that calculation. So when we do that, we can actually see the different strengthening characteristics. Let me walk you through this. So this is uh, interparty precipitate spacing, radius, volume fraction. You can see it's kind of decreasing. This is, may not be real because of our, the way we uh, do the copper precipitate analysis. But however, generally you can see that copper precipitates are dissolving the strengthening factor is essentially decreasing too. 
So, that's what we expected. The strengthening should continue to go down. This is still a problem. Why we are getting this hardening there? We couldn't explain it. So, we thought that probably some kind of precipitation may be occurring in this thing, secondary precipitation, that could have led to this. But, no. We couldn't see any uh, correlation to precipitate. So, so hey, why is this? Okay, let's think about it for a moment. When we are doing this, we got carried away. We started focusing on this copper precipitate because it's nanoscale. It's nice to do atom pro. We do everything. But one thing we forgot about is where it is sitting in. It's sitting in a modern static matrix. So, if you look at the strengthening, this is uh, work by Professor Maki. So, you can actually distribute the strengthening in a modern static matrix with the precipitates to different uh, terms here. We are going to assume these three are going to be similar because all of them have a modern city structure. So we can assume these three same. So we already looked at precipitation. Only thing we have not figured out is the grain boundary strengthening. Is there any difference in the modern city matrix? So what we are doing? We are heating and cooling. Nothing happens. No fresh austenite. In this case, fresh austenite forms come down. It's all transforming to modern site. So Everything is transforming to modern side. How would you, what would be difference in the grain boundary strengthening? But anyway, there is a classic work done by Professor Maki's group and Furahara. They all work on looking at uh, the modern side packets and everything. So Shingwa went ahead and did that work. So this is a, a summary of the results. And this is the base metal we started off with. You can see this color code means that it, the, all the modern side packets, packets are in the same orientation. So that is the modern side, a lot of modern side labs are there. And you can see a prior austenite grain size there. And you can figure out what is a packet size in each and every condition there. Base metal, that's what you expect. And you, when you went to 650s, you're going up and down. No change in austenite formation. So that means you'll inherit whatever you had it there. So no difference there. But what is intriguing is when you go to 750 and 900 degrees centigrade, I want you to see this. This is the austenite grain size. So they are very, very small austenite grains form, and then the modern side forms in this. So essentially, the packet size has been completely reduced in these two conditions there. But if you go to very high temperature, we get back to the same. But I want you to look at this. This uh, scales are different from here. This is 15 micron. This is 100 micron. So. We go to very high temperature, sure enough, austenite grain size increases drastically, and then we get back to more or less similar to base metal, no strengthening there also. Again, so Shingwa has to rationalize this as a function of using published models. So we used uh, Naylor's uh, paper as early as 1979. They actually describe what is the block width, and based on that, they calculate the slip plane, and then they calculate what is the contribution of the strength by reduction on this blocks there. So you use this formula, and then you figured out how much amount of strengthening which comes about. Of course, it's not surprising. We know that when you looked at 750, 900, you can see that the modern side packets have become smaller and smaller. So we indeed, we see the strengthening because of the modern city matrix. But if you go to very high temperature, we lose that. So that means you need to be able to control the prior austenite grain size to make sure that you get strengthening there. So having done this, we can put them in uh, our hardness. This is our uh, hardness increment we saw, and this is a predicted strength increment. Remember, we cannot predict the absolute value of hardness. We can only show a trend that it is essentially show, uh, agrees with what we have seen experimentally. So by doing this excitative characterization, we understood why softening occurs and why we are seeing this anomalous hardening at a particular temperature, mainly because refinement of this uh, modern side. Good, we've done this. So remember, why are we doing this? We wanted to understand how the softening upper occurs, how the hardening occurs. Can we use this to make sure that we don't get softening during welding? So how can you do this? So. There are two options for it, so I'm going to indulge myself. Okay, one, you can make the weld, make the whole ship, make the whole ship welding, and send it through a furnace. So I don't think you will do that. Okay, that's ridiculous. Or is there any way we could do 
inherently use the thermal cycles which comes across during welding as a way to restore the harness. So you would see that when you do multi-pass welding, if you happen to be sitting over there, you will see coarse grain heat affected zone will happen. And then when I come with this another pass here, this material will be heated back again to a higher temperature and come down. So is there any way we can kickstart the precipitation of the copper by using thermal cyclase? So that means we don't need to rely on post-well heat treatment. We can make sure we can get back the strengthening during welding itself. So that's a hypothesis. So this is interesting. This is I really enjoyed this part. Actually, the students actually brainstormed it, and then they said, "Okay, we are going to do that experiment." So they did this experiment. So they wanted to do two things. One, they produce this coarse grain heat affected zone. That is the most lowest value you can get by making coarse austenite grain size, coarse martensite packing size, all the copper precipitates are gone, so it is really, really soft microstructure. And you do that for two heat treatment conditions, that is the two cooling curves. And then they go through with this second thermal cycle. This is more or less, uh, we did it in our global thermomechanical simulation. Of course, we had to come up with some values, so they had to pick up this particular peak temperature, so you can see they went to only to 650 so that they don't form any fresh austenite there. So that's what they do. They wanted to make sure they don't have any austenite, so they did the deletometry analysis. So you can see austenite comes down, first transforms to modern site while cooling down, and then comes back, and then you go up in the secondary thermal cycle, no transformation, you come back. So we know that there is no fresh austenite formation during these two thermal cycles. Good. So if we get back the hardness. That's the key. So I still remember one day I get around 11 p.m. I asked a phone call from Shingwa. Suresh, Suresh, we got it. So I'll tell you what it is. So this is, uh, we have to do atom probe in uh, Northwestern. We don't have a local electrode atom probe in Ohio State. So he goes to do the atom probe there. And this is what you see in a coarse grain heat affected zone. Copper, everything in solution. And when you do the, um, heat treatment, the secondary thermal cycling, you can see the copper came out of that. And in fact, we restored the 340 to 405 pounds. So that showed that clearly that we can bring back the strengthening. But of course, they wanted to make sure that it happens in different cooling cycle too. They did that too. And again, consistently, you can see that the hardness comes back. And you can see that there are still more copper in the matrix, in the modern side matrix. You can get more also, but our, our thermal cycle was not good enough to get everybody out of, the, all the copper out of the matrix, but you do see the precipitation occurring, and we got back to our harness again here. Remember, this happens even with the reduction in the uh, strengthening because of the modern side, the coarse modern side we have. So this is very good, so we showcased this to Navy, so they're interested. Now they're not worried about this softening, so now the idea is how can we optimize this secondary thermal cycling during real welding conditions. So we had to work with shipyards and then make sure those thermal cycles can be achieved and then we can deploy it in Navy. So right now there is a proposal to US Navy to scale up this blast alloy 160 because of this research. Okay. But having done that, I one thing which we still needed, we've seen this uh, modern city transformation also happening. So we don't want to throw it away. We want to use it still. We wanted to understand fundamentally, can I use this packet size reduction to also as a plan B if the copper doesn't come out? We cannot use multi-pass. We have to use only single pass welding. Then can we use the modern side packet size reduction as a way to um, get back the strengthening also, even though copper is going away? So we need to understand this. There's been work done by Professor Badisha's group and GIFT talking about austenite grain size effect on the modern static start temperature. We knew about some of the work, so we wanted to track them under in situ conditions. Can we see this? So this is where um, I had to acknowledge the collaboration with Professor Terasaki and Komizo. They have this very complicated but very powerful experimental setup. What they have is a laser scanning confocal microscope. I, do we have it here? We have it, okay. So that is confocal microscope. You can actually look at the surface and look at the microstructures evolving as heats and cools down. 
they put the whole, whole setup in a synchrotron beam line, which is a spring ahead beam line. And spring ahead has a one more advantage is they have this called the Pilatus detector, which is a 2D detector. I think there may be only three available in the whole world. So one is in Grenoble, and one is in APS, and one is in spring 8. So it's a very expensive piece of detector. So you can actually uh, run these detectors at very, very fast intervals. So we can go up to 0.4 seconds or so intervals. We can get diffraction pattern. So remember why we are doing this. Why can't we do it in the laboratory? The reason why we have to do is it takes a lot of time in the laboratory. We wanted to track the phase transformation occurring under in situ conditions. So that's what we are using this technique. So Shingwa goes, I think, every other summer, works on it. He just came back last summer after doing this winter, doing on the another scale. Okay. Okay, so let me explain what this means. So these are the rings which you see uh, from the gamma and alpha. So, and that's the LSCM images. So you can get both at the same time. So then we use a, a standard method. I'm going through this experimental methodology. I'm not sure how many of you have done in-situ synchrotron. So it's maybe a good idea to go through this. So let me explain how we do it. So this is a 2D image uh, of one shot. We collect thousands of these shots every time when you do an experiment. And then we uh, integrate these intensities using a public domain software called FIT2D. And then that goes back into a 2D, the intensity versus D spacing, which you are familiar with. So you can see, uh, let me do this. So this is during a typical heat treatment. Uh, you will see arsenide forms, and the arsenide goes away, and ferrite comes up. So you can clearly see, and we can do them at very, very fine intervals, you can get that. Once you have it, you have to remember this is very important to integrate across along these rings. You need to calibrate and all those things. Once you have it, we can actually see this. This is a thermal cycle, and this is the transformation. You can see in this case, we went only to around 750 or so. It's not completely austenite. You can see ferrite, austenite form, still some BCC left, cool down then it transforms back into modern site. So that we can see. Remember, this one has low carbon, so we don't see the body center tetragonal there. You don't see the, um, the splitting of the BCC bits. We don't see that. OK, so we can also take the data. And let me go back and make sure the movie works. So you can see that you can actually fit them, and you can calculate the relative fractions of austenite and ferrite and all those things. You can also get the lattice parameter. You have to be very careful when you're doing that. There is an inherent accuracy problem. We have, to, we have to be very careful with that. OK. So then we can do in situ analysis also. Let's see the movie is working. What you're seeing is the modern side coming out. Of course, we don't have a resolution to see the modern side whole plate as it forms because it occurs much faster than the time resolution we have. But it's interesting is we can actually calculate the volume fraction of the modern site by doing image analysis. That's what's shown here. We are looking at these are all modern site packets coming out. And if you can see the resolution, this is around 60 microns. So that's the resolution we're using right now. And um, you can see there, in this case, you don't see prior austenite grains because we have still some amount of original modern site in this case. So it's quite nice. We can calculate the volume fraction of the modern site too. And this can be readily done using any uh, analysis software. In this case, I used a program called Igor Pro, which can do this. OK, got it. We got the data enough. And then now we can analyze each and every sample going up to different peak temperatures. Let's look at this. This is a sample which went up to very high temperature around 1,300 and cooling down. And uh, I don't know whether you can see it over there. That is the prior osmate grains. And we are cooling down. And then one of the things you will realize is when the austenite grain size becomes huge, the amount of volume being diffracted is reduced. Because of that, you do get the signals become very close to the background. That is why you see the streaks. And you can see this because very coarse austenite grains. And then cool down. Around here, the transformation occurs. You get this nice packets. It's beautiful to see them when you see it in real life how it comes up there. Okay, so that's one on the course last night. 
And this is what more interesting. Again, what we wanted to see is that how, when you have a small austenite grain size, how does it control the modern side packets? So you see it clearly. This is very small austenite grains. You can actually see them around here. These are austenite grains. And then in this case, you don't see that noise, mainly because a lot of austenite grains are diffracting into it. Smooth, very nice curves. And then it transforms to modern side and come down to low temperature. So this is nice. So you can we see that. In addition to that, we can also pick up the MS temperature for this tip. I'm going to go quickly through all the um, different uh, peak temperatures. In this case, we don't go to fully austenite. Even then, you get this very fine um, modern side packets in this. So you can see that. So if you put all those data into a particular plot like this, so this is what we see. This is fraction transform the y-axis, and then x-axis the temperature. We are cooling down. In the case of coarse grain heat affected zone, the transformation starts off much earlier than the ones which are fine grain and also this one. Here you have to remember there is already some amount of ferrite or modern site exists, and then the austenite transforms to modern site here. So this is not new. You can, if you look at it, this reduction in MS temperatures has been reported from, I think, from here, I believe. The fan showed this. And you can see this is austenite grain size and MS temperature actually dropping down. So only thing additional information we get by doing this is the packet size reduction also we are seeing with the reduction in the grain size of the austenite. So it's good. So there is some hope even if the copper precipitates doesn't work, we may be able to make sure the prior austenite grain size doesn't grow too much in the uh, coarse grain size. Can we really do that? So that is also the plan B we propose to US Navy, saying that we would like to modify the blast alloy 160 to put some precipitates to pin the austenite grain boundaries so that they don't grow to 100 micron or 150 micron size. We wanted to make it smaller. It is not easy because uh, there has been extensive amount of literature on this uh, precipitate control on the austenite grain size. But we need to think about it, whether can we do it in the blast alloy 160. So that is our plan B. So copper precipitates doesn't work. We we'll look at this too. So that's uh, related to what we have done in the blast alloy 160 looking at the heat affected zone. But there is something else. So like Steve Jobs, there is one more thing. OK. So, so remember, blast alloy means you're putting iron, a lot of copper, a lot of nickel, and all those things control way to produce strengths of very, very high strength levels. But if you ask a welding consumable manufacturer, they'll say, what? That strength doesn't exist. You can go up to around 120 KSI, but it's not possible more than that. You not get high strength levels in the value metal. So what can we do? So we focused on one thing. This is already a published work by one of my postdoc, Muruganan. So I, he's right now in Australia, but we, I'm just going to show you how we can go about doing the optimization valve metal too. So I'm going to share that. But we haven't solved the problem for blast alloy yet. So for a welding metallurgist, we like this microstructure. We call this million dollar microstructure, mainly because we spent lots of money to maximize this acicular right? And uh, we wanted to make sure that we can get maximum amount of acicular right? So at least we can get that part for the blast alloy, even though we may not be able to get the strength levels up. So how can we design these consumables? So I think. Uh, Professor Badisha would have told you about his model, 1985, he developed that model. So we had an access to this model. So what we did is made that model as a black box. And then um, Muruganand actually worked on an uh, optimization algorithm, so it will interrogate this uh, computational model and then ask it to give, hey, what is the composition will give you optimum properties, optimum acyclic right? So it will go through this. So I usually tell my students, so uh, I don't know how many, is there anybody from welding consumable manufacturer here? Nobody. OK. If you are going to do one experiment for a welding consumable trial, it's cost you around $10,000. 
So, take a consumable, validate, test it, do optical metallography. So, it takes around two weeks or so. That is what the amount of money you have to spend. Okay? So, I tell this as a preamble, and then I'm going to show you the results. And I'll tell the students, when you go through every iteration, you can say how much money you're saving. So, let's see. Okay? So in our case, what we are doing is that we have to maintain a particular uh, boundary conditions. We only are allowing the composition. We are keeping the process parameters constant because we wanted to work with what is available in a uh, real uh, shipbuilding or any uh, construction place. And then we also didn't want carbon to exceed more than 0.48%. We didn't want alloying additions to increase more than 2.8%. We also said that maximize acyclic right at 95% because we didn't want it to go to 100% because there is another difficulty comes in. If you get rid of alertrium of it, you get bainite. So we don't want that. So how do we get this? Okay. So I'm going to indulge here. Okay. So I want you to keep a count on iteration number every time you count $15,000, 10000 Keep going. Okay. So there it is. So this is uh, what it is doing is carbon and silicon manganese is varying and it is calculating allotriomorphic ferrite, Wittmann-Stratton ferrite, acyclic ferrite. You will see time to time you won't see anything, mainly because you have gone to a condition where acyclic ferrite will not be favored, mostly bainitic microstructure will be favored. So that's why it will be silent in those conditions. But you can see that it is coming around, it's doing around a lot of iterations. So Murugan ran this for two days. So left it alone. So it went through a lot of analysis to come up with what is the optimum composition for this. And uh, one of the things he did is also we uh, looked at different uh, starting point. We wanted to make sure that we are not biasing by looking at a starting point there. Interesting. I'm going to stop. I don't want to go through around 1,000 uh, iterations there. Okay. So you know that we already saved half a million dollars. Okay. So. So no one thing which came out of this result is something interesting. So there is no unique composition. Most of the composition, we ran around 12 simulations. They all came up with more or less a cyclic right. But you can see the composition varies. More interesting is you can see some have carbon up to levels of 0.33. Also, n nobody puts that much in consumables. But you can get it with that quite a lot of a cyclic right also. So I felt a little stupid after doing this, but I said there must be a reason for this. And if you if you can go back to 1985 Harry's paper, he always talks about carbon equivalence. So that is related to somehow the carbon equivalence formula too. But we wanted to check it out for, further why this is the case. So remember behind the scenes of these models we are calculating a time temperature transformation diagram. If you put all those compositions, this is what it is. So you can see the shape of the curve is more or less the same. So this is intriguing. So for a particular cooling rate, the shape of the, uh, the TTT curve should be a particular way so that we can get a higher amount of acyclic ferrite. So you can imagine that for this is for one cooling rate, but in real life you will use wide range of cooling rates, so there may not be possible to get similar amount of acyclic ferrite in all the wells. That's interesting. So that's mainly because of the time temperature transformation diagram is invariant because any compositions can give you the same thing. So if you go back, uh, Glenn Evans, he did quite a lot of work on different composition. It explains this too. But we wanted to make sure that what is more involved is what is the sensitivity of this. So we did some uh, detailed analysis. This is what's shown here. Carbon is on the x-axis, manganese in the y-axis. We varied that variable and made a, a matrix of a cyclic ferrite fraction. You would keep other variables constant. What you would notice is if you have a low alloying additions, you can only go to around, around here and then above this it drops off, mainly because you trigger there is no alertrium of ferrite, so you don't want that condition. If you go to higher alloying additions, you get smaller window compared to what you started off with. So this is interesting because we are realizing in, lit in industry that there is a quite a lot of heterogeneity in the valves. And uh, for example, if a consumable manufacturer makes one consumable and gives it to a company, you go and weld it. 
So if the welder wants to make a quick high productivity, he will run at high speeds, even though the welding consumable manufacturer would have told not to do that. So that is really a danger. So that is most recently, that is why without knowing, most of the consumable manufacturer will sit here so that they don't fall off into that region. Without knowing it, their consumables have been optimized that way. So we, uh, this is important for when we decide to develop a consumables for Blast Alloy 160, we need to think about how we are going to deploy in a uh, shipbuilding industry. So that is important. So there is a lot of work we are doing related to heterogeneity on this. So I think how much I'm doing time. It's okay. So let me pause for a moment. What we have shown here. We can do fundamental understanding of the heat affected zone. We can develop models. We came up with a way to solve heat affected zone problems. So Navy is happy and they're moving forward with base metal development. But however, the consumables is a big problem. So one of the proposal for them is we wanted to start with the clean slate. Means essentially start with iron carbon. So start with iron carbon or don't even worry about iron carbon. Can we use like modern static stainless steel type approach? So can we make a consumables based on that? We haven't got solved the problem yet. So that is going to be the lingering problem for the blast alloy 160. But how do we go about doing that? Not only on the toughness, the, the shipbuilding industry is interested in also distortion, residual stresses. So how can we do this? So if you go back to 1990s, I really like this paper because I was a PhD student. I read this paper, Cricaldi Dallup, and in fact, actually Bruno, I think, uh, I think not Cricaldi, st student actually drew this picture. So uh, he actually showed this that in, in it is possible to develop an integrated model by which transient temperature field, if it is known, if you know the transmission behavior, you can describe microstructure, you can describe the mechanical performance of that. So this has been one of uh, the kind of nagging question back of mind, can we really do it? There are some commercial softwares like Sysweld, VRWeld, and some other work by Austin Wrong. They all have similar software. But however, to run this software, you got to have a PhD in applied mechanics. So it's not available for a welding engineer. So can we really do this? So we are moving forward on that. So there is a very meager attempt at doing this. And uh, this was done at collaboration with Edison Welding Institute. So what we have done is that they have developed a computational weld mechanics software based on an abacus computer, which sits on an Ohio supercomputing center. And the front end for this is essentially like a welder engineer. So what he really cares about it. And that's what it is. And all the input is taken. And then we solve it on the supercomputing architecture. And then 15 minutes later, you get a report. Since GIFT is an academic institute, right, Harry, you can get access to it. Right now, KWL predictor is being launched. But one problem is this is and we need more validation. More people work, look, use it, and see where the holes are. Because models are models based on the framework we have in, behind it. So this may have a lot of holes. It may have a lot of problems. But we need to test it out. And, but this is being helpful for doing what if scenarios. I use it in my class right now. I tell the students uh, after teaching welding metallurgy of steel, I tell them that, OK, you have an X65 steel for a pipeline you have to displace it with x80 because that's what you want to do. What is going to happen? So they go back, do the assignments, and come back and come up with sometimes very interesting results, something which I never thought about it too. And so it's quite possible to do that. What we haven't done is couple this with the optimization tool yet. We haven't done that. So if you go there, you can try to look at typical uh, how it works. OK, that's going on. So this is where, uh, this is my dream. I had to have a dream. OK, so uh, how many of you use uh, online uh, for travel booking or hotel booking? All of you. All of you use it, OK? So then you'd say that I want to be in this con uh, country, this city. 
and it will give you three star rating, four star rating. You can pick whatever you want based on the cost. I wish, I wish, before I retire, okay? So we could do that same thing. For example, I run with, I work with 28 companies as a part of the center. What they really care about, I, they don't care about face transformation. They don't care about what gamma prime comes out of it. What they really care about is can I make well economically, high quality, and with the productivity. I'm here joking, of course, they don't care, but they do care about them. But however, they are being pushed into those regions. So we can do it. We can have a, a welding process model or a materials model which can tell you the quality, which can also have a welding process model which will tell you whether the productivity can be increased. And the economics also can be input into the welding. So in fact, I believe that probably by this time, we would have a hot wire for welding. So we should be able to do this. And I hope, at least not me, my students would be able to do it. So that's, that's the way we want to go, okay? So I think I'll summarize what I've talked to you today. Welding sometimes is very complex. People think it's so complex, but if you break it down into small chunks, it is indeed exciting and handleable. We can do it. And for example, there are a lot of tools available. Sometimes I tell my students that you got, they, got, they are very um, uh, gifted because they, have, they can walk around and do institute. And they can walk around and do Adam Pro. And I still remember as a PhD student, getting onto Adam Pro was so tough. But we can do it right now. So, but it is quite easy to do this um, ex situ and in situ characterization. And you can develop new welding consumables, welding process on that. I hope I demonstrated that it can be done with the Blast Alloy 160. But the proof is, of course, if the US Navy funds us to expand it. So, that, ask me in a year whether we are successful. No. And then, finally, whatever we develop, should be accessible to welding engineers. So that's what also there is a way to go forward. I hope you guys can contribute in that area also. I think I'll summarize, I'll stop there. Any questions and comments? I would like to hear from you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Not at all. Yes. 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 Uh, for a blast resistant steel. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So it's a good question. So I don't know much about the armor materials, what goes into the definition of what needs to be done, because sometimes it's proprietary. But in the case of blast alloy, it is more relation to blast resistant. If, uh, if you put an explosive and blow it up, this actually should not shatter around pieces into minor pieces. That it should absorb and crack or something. That is the idea for doing that. That's correct. Agreed. You have a copper melting, so that's correct. No, not in this case. But there is a project which we are working with a small innovator, uh, SFP LLC, where flash process steels, there the bullet resistance is very important. That's much I can tell you, not more than that. So. If I, I don't, I, I may uh, muddle around here. There was uh, austenitic uh, called, uh, they wanted to use a double hull, and uh, it was uh, uh, austenitic alloy. I, I remember, right? They, but they shut down the project. They, it's too expensive with a lot of nickel in it, and also I'll come back. It, remember, it'll come back to me in a moment on that. So I'm getting old. So. That is, uh, I forgot its name. It's uh, nickel, it's austenitic stainless steel, uh, and then 
but with a lot of chromium, they developed the consumables for that too, but it was too expensive to shut down. They consider that. It's a double hull material for that. Very structurally. <laughs> okay. That's right. So if you don't ask, I will tell you all the weaknesses in our model. So you can grill me more. <laughs> okay. Yes. Martensitic. It is martensitic. So the, the definition there put slash bainitic, they also consider slow cooling sometimes to get a bainite, but mostly it's martensitic structure in this case. That's correct, but see, that's the heat treatment which goes through that. So if you look at this, I forgot where I left here. You can see that you do austenitize, you water quench, go to the liquid nitrogen, hold for 30 minutes. So transform whatever the austenite into modern site, come back to room temperature, and then go to two heat 550, 450 to do that. So the the reason why they are doing tempering is not to uh, the carbon problem, because carbon is very low, you can see that. So they form this uh, nano plus copper precipitates and MO2C precipitates. So that's what they do. That's correct. Good, uh, good question. We don't have any chrome carbides in this, in uh, our analysis so far we have done. But that doesn't mean it cannot form. We, the, the heat treatment chosen such a way that it doesn't form in this case. And we haven't seen it in our valves also yet. So. Yes? Sure. That's correct. Yes. It doesn't, uh, so one thing which we had to come up with uh, secondary hardening in the cyclic frame, we need to do somehow add similar concept to do that. But even then, the strength of the blastoli we cannot reach yet right now. So what we are trying to do is to shut down the cyclic frame idea. And we wanted to go down the path of 17.4 Martin Siddick stainless steel approach. So that is what our approach we are thinking. But even then, the strength levels are not that because we don't have a copper to give you that strength. So I, we have some concepts uh, trying, uh, Greg Olson and we have put together. So don't know that it's going to work out. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Second. Yes. So we see that quite a lot before the transformation occurs, kind of sharpens. That's what you're talking about? OK. Let me go. Uh, I'm looking at, uh, OK, this way. OK. So if you go back to, let me go to, OK. Yeah, so that's the one here. So. It's a good question. So I've asked, we have done looking at the lattice parameter uh, distribution. And we don't think it is any inhomogeneity of composition because carbon is very low. It may be because straining, because we may be putting some strains on the surface too. That is the only hypothesis we have. Right? We don't have any way to prove that yet right now. So we, but one thing we do see that sometimes it sharpens on cooling, actually. It sharpens before transformation occurs. So Greg Olson thinks it's kind of probably austenite, some soft phone or something he said. But I don't know anything. So, so, so. go ahead. K1C on the base metals have been measured. Not on wells yet. No, not yet. So that will be the next step to do that. Good question. So this, the toughness, very low temperatures was measured. So it doesn't, we haven't gone to a temperature where it is brittle yet. So this is actually, 
Uh, I don't remember the data, so it's on a paper around minus 60 degrees centigrade. Very good toughness we got there. So. So. Yes. That's correct. Good. So three point three point three nine. So yes, quite a lot of copper. Uh, let me go back to analysis. So, so let me go back. So I think the composition is uh, here. There it is. That's a lot of copper. So. Your, you, you, this is important question. So, my student actually looked at whether the moly carbide also gives rise to strengthening. Uh, in our, remember, we did our secondary heat treatment where we tried to get the copper out. We do see some moly carbides coming out, but however, the predominantly the strength is because of the copper precipitates which is coming out. So, the number density we are working with is much more smaller than than the number density in the basement. So that's correct. So you can actually, there was a data which we had. So we did calculate it. So that's uh, here. So you can see copper concentrate atomic percent we have. This is we calculated using thermocal. And this is the uh, copper in ferrite and copper in osmine. You can see it goes up when you go to high temperature. Osmine. In solution. We had to be careful. That's, of course. We may get sometimes incipient melting. That's another problem with this also. For yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah. No, yeah, go ahead. So the main purpose of developing blast alloy is they want a deck plate which is blast resistant. But however, the deck plates are welded. So you need to develop a welding. That's what our focus was. So, But they developed a blast alloy. It is available, right? You can scale it up. But the US Navy doesn't want to scale up because if you cannot weld it. So that's the reason we're working. Focusing on welding. That's right. So we are developing on three things. One, optimum welding process, too, for welding them. And the second one is also basement modification, too, to that so that we can pin the austenite grain size. The third one, which we are working on, is a consumable development for that also. That is what I told Harry. We cannot yet get that strength levels. Models? Agree. Uh, so we have to do experimental work. Yes, we have to do this. And we are in, once you come up with optimum composition, we have to go through a work with the consumable company. So like we do have some Lincoln and Hobart companies. They are interested in working with us. They will make some experimental wires with that composition. And then we will weld it. And we will test it, K1C, CTOD, all those things. Okay, so that's a good question. So right now, if you go to the ship, shipyards, it's manual welding, steel and metal arc welding, they do. And uh, there is a push in the shipyards to move towards automated process. So they are focusing on flex code arc welding, gas metal arc welding, that's moving towards that. So by the time that implemented, we would come with a gas metal arc welding process only. We don't want to use shielded metal arc welding for this because we would like to have a, improve the productivity too. So that's the.
Agreed? So it's not easy. It is difficult, but uh, however, we do have, okay, what is it called? Connection or network, <laughs> okay? So I, I will, in this case, I have to be honest to you. There is a company which we work with, uh, Lincoln and Hobart, they're all part of the NSF IUCRC Center. So they do wonders. You can actually tell them to do experimental well consumables. They know how to do it because they have legacy knowledge. They don't have, don't have the models like it, but I have a lot of respect for them because they know what to do. And they know how to pack it, how to put the ferro-alloying additions inside. But even them, they, didn't, they said that this strength levels we are looking for is impossible. They told that. But we had to come up with some alloy composition. Agree, it's not easy. If it was easy, they would have solved it. Yes, that's correct. Even in, I didn't have time to go through this. Even blast alloy, we went through a hot cracking. Because you would imagine that having these copper precipitates everywhere, heat up quickly, the copper will form liquid right away at 1,000 degrees centigrade up to 1,100 centigrade. So Jeremy went through that test, and then we do see hot sharpness in certain cases. Because then one way to avoid that is heat up slowly so the copper dissolves before it forms liquid. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So should I do anything here?